Brian, I'm so excited to be here talking with you all today. I love marketplace businesses. I'm excited to share some of my learnings along the way and also learn from many of you um, here. Uh, so my, by way of background, I've been working on marketplaces for about 14 years now across all stages of the startup life cycle. I've co-founded my own uh, local marketplace startup called Skillslate, uh, which was backed by First Round Capital. We sold to TaskRabbit. I spent about a year at TaskRabbit, helped to evolve their business to a more managed marketplace model. And most recently, I've spent the last five years at Eventbrite as the first uh, VP of growth, helping to really scale both sides of the marketplace. And so with that, uh, I'll be sharing uh, one of the most powerful dynamics that I've learned throughout my time working on marketplaces. It's uh, not applicable to all marketplaces, but those that have this dynamic, it can be incredibly powerful. So this may be, let's see if this will work. It's not working. There we go, okay. So probably everyone knows this, the importance of network effects in marketplaces. And this is a quote that I love by James Courier, who's speaking here today. He said, the only feature that mattered was that everyone was there. Whoever gets the network effect first wins. But that's a really, really long path. We all know it's a slog to get there, very, very difficult. Uh, but along that path to winning, I'm gonna share how some of the greatest marketplace businesses acquire a huge number of customers at a near $0 marginal cost of acquisition. Uh, because I've learned that some of the best two-sided networks share something in common. It's a very powerful dynamic that isn't widely talked about. In fact, many of the growth folks that I talk to where this dynamic does exist, they're a little bit secretive. Like uh, speaking with the PM of growth at GoFundMe, we had this awkward conversation. We were kind of like, well, do you see this happening? Do you see this happening? It was kind of like, who's going to be first to share? But then you see that it's happening on both and you, you dig in. Uh, so let's see. This is pretty annoying. Uh, so, okay, so you're sold. Let's get more into the, the details about what we're talking about. Uh, so to baseline a little bit, demonstration virality, which was first coined, I heard, uh, by Josh Ellman at Greylock, it's when the nature of using the product is such that simply by using it, people are showing it off. So here's a classic example, Uber in the early days. You'd show up in a black car, your friends would be waiting for you, they'd see you, you'd step out, and they'd ask, like, what's the deal? That's, that's awesome, how'd you do that? And you'd share it with your, your friends. Very classically, Lyft had the same dynamic, but they were pretty brilliant marketers. They had these flashy mustaches. I don't know if any of you recall those, but it was like so impossible to miss. It was just brilliant strategy and really fueling that demonstration virality. And there are a couple different flavors here. So one is same side demonstration virality. And this is where, say like one side, the demand side, those users are sharing it off with other demand side users, which can really help to fuel that same side of the marketplace. So Instagram is a classic example. While not a marketplace per se, it's a two-sided network. And initially users were using it mostly for the photo filters. So how do I make these cool retro filters that make my, my images look better? And they had a built-in mechanism where you could then share to your Facebook and Twitter communities and push it out to these networks. And in doing so, they had another strong dynamic. So a lot of these users, these demand side users would see, wow, that's an awesome pick. How'd you make your picture look like that? I want that too. And so sometimes this also drives users back to the creators or the supply side, which is an incredibly powerful dynamic when you get that flywheel going. And for Instagram, it also helped to fuel their own social network, which I think was part of the, the core threat to Facebook and part of the reason why they, were, they sold for a billion dollars. And when it happens in both directions, it's truly magic. It just, the business takes off. So I call this, like when it goes both ways, I call it cross-side demonstration virality when it, when it expands on both. And so you'll see it as the supply side showing off the product, the demand side sharing that product, and then the piece that I'm gonna spend the most time talking about, because I think it's the least widely talked about, is when that demand starts to convert to supply and how that can further perpetuate this dynamic. Uh, which can really be pivotal in driving those cross-side network effects or the marketplace flywheel uh, that we're all striving for. Uh, so cross-side demonstration virality has really been core to Eventbrite's growth through the years and many other two-sided networks. Um, this is a video, it's actually publicly accessible, of Julia and Kevin Hartz, the founders of Eventbrite, speaking with Roloff Botha of Sequoia Capital. This was right after uh, Sequoia led Eventbrite Series A, and it was a Q&A talking about Roloff's investment thesis and why he bet on Eventbrite. And one of the quotes that grabbed my attention here 
is he said, during diligence, I cold called customers and asked, how did you learn about Eventbrite? Many of them referenced buying a ticket first. So he uncovered, hey, there's this mechanic of virality built in whereby you bring event creators to the platform, they market their events to the demand side. Some of the demand side learns about the service and when they have a need to organize an event, they become that event creator as well. And so here's how it looks for us. So we acquire supply event creators, they bring their events to the platform, they market their events to their attendees, their built-in audiences. Eventbrite also now works on demand acquisition. How do we drive more buyers into the marketplace? And a relatively small percentage of them become organizers and the flywheel grows. And then so as the, the base of your attendees or demand side grows, and when you have this dynamic and you've tuned it, really the number of supply side grows along with it and they reinforce one another. So just to summarize, Eventbrite is now the largest live experiences platform in the world by number of events and number of event creators. Last year alone, we sold more than 200 million tickets globally across 180 countries. We had 50 million plus active ticket buyers and we've done more than $10 billion in gross merchandise value since, uh, since inception. And you might be thinking, cool, that's awesome for you, but why do I care and why does this matter to me? And I'm gonna get into that. Starting with how to identify if this growth dynamic is happening. I think this is applicable both to investors seeking to better understand our companies that I'm looking at, have, do they have this dynamic, and as operators and how we might lean into it. So going back to that notion of the same side demonstration virality, it tends to be a lot more obvious. You can track and measure in product referrals. Are they happening if you have that mechanic in your business? You can look at how much traffic is coming from organic channels like uh, free social, et cetera. And then you can see, is this activity organically happening? Are people in my network sharing this service uh, such that you can see that it's happening? Now this cross-side virality and conversion is much more subtle. And part of the reason is there tend to be far fewer sellers in the marketplace and the numbers, the conversion rates tend to be small. Um, but because marketplaces have so many more buyers, even small conversion rates can really fuel the supply side, particularly given that most marketplaces have a small number of sellers that drive uh, the bulk of the volume. So you, you typically see the Pareto principle of 20% of your sellers contribute 80% of the sales. Uh, so one thing I recommend is look in the data within a company, within your own company or within another, to see if this buyer to seller conversion is already happening. This is some old Eventbrite data showing uh, same month conversion rate. So of new buyers that enter the platform, how many convert into sellers in the same month? How many convert one month out? How many convert two months out? Trying to see, is it happening organically? And it, you'll tend to see it in a pretty steady state. Like it tends to be pretty flat line and increasing over time. Here's another cohort-based view. Uh, so again, new demand side cohorts, how, at what rates do they convert into the supply side and how does that trail off? And if you see anything like this, it's gold. So if it isn't happening organically, I actually don't recommend that you try to build this mechanic into, the plat into your platform or into your marketplace. It's probably not right for you. Every marketplace where I've seen this happening, it was happening at some level already um, before it was really leaned into. But if it is happening, like be really happy. This is a huge lever. I've also found that it's a much more critical growth path when you're starting a service uh, that's really attacking a greenfield market. So many businesses, there's existing demand. It's people searching for things like online ticketing. But in the early days for Eventbrite, um, there were no solutions for the long tail of the market. So there wasn't actually a lot of demand already built in. Like not many people were seeking it out. So with a new greenfield market, um, often you're trying to replace a substitute solution, like people uh, before using Eventbrite were using pen, paper, PayPal, checks, et cetera, and they aren't actively seeking it out. So really this mechanic can help show your target audience through usage of the product that there's a better way of doing things. So when you see it happening, you really need to figure out why it's happening and also why not. You wanna understand the blockers to people converting and making that jump. And starting with, does your demand side even understand how your product works? And like the obvious answer is, oh yeah, they get it. Uh, oftentimes that's not the case. So this was an old survey that we did at Eventbrite where we found one out of two of our event and attendees didn't know whether to agree with the statement, anyone organizing events can sell tickets through Eventbrite. So 50% of the addressable market didn't understand that it was accessible to them. They thought it was 
uh, for use for higher end events or, or other use cases. That's a huge gap. So if your demand side doesn't understand the basics, you have little chance to convert them. And our hypothesis became helping the demand side better understand the supply side use of the platform will improve that conversion rate. So our goal was to get every attendee on the platform to understand that they can organize their own event on Eventbrite. Uh, one of the key methods in uncovering some of these insights are talking to the users who have converting, converted, seek to understand why and what the aha moment was for them. So we spoke with 20 users early on who had made this conversion jump. Our objective was to understand why and then form hypotheses on what tests could we run to seek to move those. So the next section will be about how to lean in and test driving this growth dynamic with some examples from Eventbrite and other two-sided networks. So a common question I get is where do I focus? So if the most simple formula is this buyer to seller cohort growth is fueled by a number of buyers times your buyer to seller conversion rate, I always suggest start with the conversion side. See if you can move that. Uh, we talked to Stan Chinovsky, who's a, a noted growth guru. Uh, he co-founded NFX Guild uh, with James Courier and others. And his advice was marketplaces are all about conversion and then you pile on with top of funnel, which I very much agree with. So optimizing for this conversion requires a couple basic things. So potential converts need to A, know who you are, you don't have a shot at converting them if they don't know who you are. Two, they need to know what you do and how you help them. So what's your aha moment of value? And then they need to keep you top of mind for when that need arises. Uh, so my suggestion is start with the high traffic parts of your product where your brand isn't positioned particularly well and then make it more clear and run experiments to see if you can drive lift. I also suggest use those insights from the customer development that you've done around these converted users to use the same words that those converts use in describing your service to the prospects you're trying to convert. So a couple examples, Kelsey, that, who we spoke with, said, I was seeking a better way than Forms and PayPal. That translates to me into messaging that we can test around save time, there's a better way. As a consumer buying tickets for my kids, I thought this was easy and it worked, and that was enough for me to try Eventbrite. Okay, so for messaging, it's easy. You had a great experience with Eventbrite. You can use it for your own attendees as well. All right, and going into some experiment ideas. Um, I found that the most effective tacti tactics span it all. So in product messaging uh, and calls to actions, notification and email, performance marketing, and they tend to work much better in conjunction with one another. So if you find a key segment of users that you want to drive conversion for, Doing in-product tests, email, custom audience retargeting in a coordinated fashion drives better results than different uh, functions running in silos trying to move them independently. Which goes to my recommendation about using a cross-functional growth team that's core, their core focus for a period of time should be on moving this conversion rate and then building uh, both models for how we think we can grow it and why do we think we should do more of it and then experiments to optimize. So forming a lot of uh, hypotheses and A-B tests that can help to move those metrics forward. Uh, that was the approach we used at Eventbrite. We pitched it as a six month test actually to form this cross-functional team. Uh, we had our hypothesis and we had a, a backlog of tests that we wanted to run. There was some pushback on whether that was the best use of a uh, small engineering and product squad, but over time we showed we were able to move the metrics forward and actually kept the growth team in perpetuity based on proving that out. Yeah. Uh, so I was the first member of the team. I brought in a product manager who had a very growth uh, mindset. Uh, there were four engineers, uh, part of a UX and visual design resource, and part of an analyst time. And we were all working together, meeting almost every day to share hypotheses, make sure we had the right prioritization of our backlog. Uh, I, I was filling the role of the marketer, but cross-functional hats. But yeah, at scale, typically there's one growth marketer as part of that team. Um, so one thing I've learned is measuring these experiments is really challenging and particularly when the usage of your product is less frequent, it's harder to A-B test given the latency. <laughs> but I'm gonna share a few ways that we've learned for measuring these tests. Whoops. Uh, so measuring progress via same day or same week, so low latency cohorts, tends to be a good leading indicator. This blue line is users who convert in the same week from buyer to seller. 
Then going down, it's within one week and two weeks. You'll see there's a big drop off for us, but I've seen this consistently across marketplaces. The activity tends to happen when the buyers are on the site or your service interacting. So measuring that, and then you can see over time, is it trending up or down? And that can give you some directional indicator of are your tests working? Uh, if you drive enough impact, even pre and post lift can be pretty clear. So here's an example of uh, Eventbrite's conversion rate from buyer to seller. If you were to take this back in time, you'd see it was absolutely flat, just not moving. And then we mapped a lot of the experiments we ran and you can see we've made step function lifts. We stopped working in this area, flatlined again, made a bunch more improvements, step functioned up again. It's not the most precise and scientific, but it can sometimes help to reinforce the impact. And ultimately, we tripled this conversion rate over about two years of testing. So again, you're trying to show who you are and what you do. What's your core product value? And emphasizing consistent branding and key messaging throughout that customer journey can really help. So wait, who are you again? Like this is, I'm almost embarrassed to show this. This is circa 2009, Dylan and Old Eventbrite uh, employee will remember this. but. Um, I call this the MySpace of event listings back then. It was like totally customizable. There was no Eventbrite logo. It was pretty ghetto looking. Um, <laughs> but over time, Eventbrite has moved to much more consistency. Um, things like having a very consistent logo so people know that they're on Eventbrite. Actually increasing that logo size has helped over time. Uh, and people better understand that this is actually Eventbrite's service. Using an example from SurveyMonkey, um, some great companies that do this use key flows to remind users who they are and what they do. So this is uh, a flow of taking a survey on SurveyMonkey. Right below the sort of uh, submit your survey, there's a powered by SurveyMonkey and it says, see how easy it is to create a survey with a call to action. So it does three things. It's the branding, it's who. Who's, who's powering this? It's the what. So see how easy it is to create a survey. Okay, that's what they do. And a link and a call to action to do so. Then you submit your survey responses and whoa, it's like you feel like you're on the home page here, but no, this is actually the survey complete page. Like that is such prime real estate to push somebody who has completed the core action of taking a survey to now you're trying to get them to uh, use your service for the supply side or, or creating surveys. So while that's a pretty aggressive example, I have found at Eventbrite, this is an order confirmation page. So once you've purchased a ticket, uh, we've tested messaging around you can use Eventbrite too for your events. Uh, marketplace listings tend to have very high traffic, so use those pages. You'll see Etsy has a sell on Etsy call to action. Uh, GoFundMe, the same thing. Uh, so clear positioning and messaging in visible locations can be really helpful. Here's Airbnb site. You see you can search for listings. So okay, I understand I can find listings on this site or become a host. I can rent my own space. Uh, Eventbrite's highest traffic pages did not communicate what we did. It's hard to see, but it used to say right next to the logo, logo contact the organizer for event registration information. That doesn't really say what we do. So one of our highest impact tests was actually just changing the messaging to either create an event or find events. It's clear positioning on what the service does. Here's a really old Airbnb experiment where they were trying to draw more attention. Uh, this is a logged in traveler account um, to in, uh, message that they should list their space. Um, coincidentally, this is actually faked test, that's Gustav, who's the former head of growth at Airbnb, his little image trying to fake like he's your friend and you should do this too. I thought that was clever. Uh, this was another really clever one that Airbnb did. So uh, this is hard to see, but this is on one of their marketplace listings. If you send a message to the host asking for more information, immediately after you hit send, it refreshes in that modal and says, uh, list your home to pay for your trip. Like that's really in intelligent, right? You've shown intent that you're gonna be out of your home traveling. Um, wow, that's a compelling message. I can pay for my trip by doing so. So they've, they've gotten really creative in how they can drive that dynamic. Uh, I've also seen a lot of benefit in making use of lower value pages. So this is an Eventbrite listing that's already expired. It's already past the deadline. So having calls to action to find events or create your event. And just thinking more broadly, like what other real estate do you have? So Uber and their app, they have a drive with Uber call to action. These are old PDF tickets where a lot of people were using PDF tickets for Eventbrite. We actually added a, hey, do you organize events? Use Eventbrite. It's just think about it as like ad space. 
But you're probably thinking this feels pretty spray and pray. How do I get more targeted? And so I would say I'm going to speed up because I'm running out of time. Um, analytics and segmentation are your friends. So who are these customers? Who has a higher propensity to convert? And when are they most likely to? So we did things looking for predictive markers of this aha moment in the data. So plotting things like, of people who have converted, how many events have they attended? Uh, and is there a point where they become materially more likely to convert? And I can't share that number, but yes, there is. There was a, a very, very significant marker where people were more likely to convert. And then we focused all actions on how do you drive towards converting those people. With horizontal marketplaces, cross-category usage can often drive the aha moment. So what I've seen consistently is like when a one-time buyer comes to Etsy, they buy a piece of jewelry, they can often think, oh yeah, Etsy's about selling handmade jewelry. But as soon as they buy across two categories, they think, oh, I bought an Etsy. They sell all kinds of handmade goods. That's really important in creating that aha of, oh, this is a broad open platform. Uh, so leveraging these insights for more targeted and personal notifications, this is a triggered email that we created at Eventbrite. When somebody buys across two or more events, it, re it references the specific events they attended and then it uses the value props that we discovered in the customer interviews earlier to describe why you should convert and use the service. That was pretty powerful. So once you've maxed out that conversion rate gain, growing the demand side is the icing on the cake to fuel the viral loop. And so in closing, this cross-site demonstration virality is really your friend. I encourage you to seek it out and to embrace it. It's the supply side showing off your product, the demand side sharing it, and a percent of that demand side turning into supply and fueling the marketplace flywheel. So when you find it, embrace it. Build one of the great marketplaces acquiring huge volumes of customers at near zero dollars CAC, and you'll win your market. So with that, thank you. Any questions or comments? Dylan. How do you think about measuring incrementality in this type of growth equation? Do you, I mean, are you positioning it, whether internally to the team or upwards to management, that this is more a cost-effective way to acquire uh, the same organizer that you might acquire elsewhere, or mm -hmm. it's actually net new conversion of it's, that's a great question. It's typically not pure net new, but a touch path along a multi-touch journey. So it's very hard to tease out pure incrementality. So like when I say zero cost of acquisition, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm overstating that. But yeah, it's a path along the way. And we've done things like measured, forecasted out where would this uh, conversion rate be had we not experimented and what is the lift that we're seeing and how is that affecting growth rate to try to quantify. All right, so I think we're out of time, but I'd love any feedback if you have any. Thank you. Thank you.